The recording has started. This is the April 18th meeting of the Web RTC Working Group. We have two hours today. The group abides by the IPR policy, which is at the link described here. And only people and companies that are listed on the status page are allowed to make substantive contributions. Uh, we're going to cover, try to cover a lot of things today. It could be a very time challenged meeting. Uh, Peter Thatcher will be acting as time police during the first slot. We'll try to keep him honest after that. Uh, so the slides are up on the wiki, or link to them is up on the wiki. The meeting is being recorded, and we have a volunteer for note taking, which is Henrik. A reminder about the code of conduct we operate under it. Please keep things professional and cordial. Um, some interim meeting tips, please raise hands to get into the speaking the speaker queue and lower hands to get out of it um, and wait for the mi microphone access. We will mute you if you try to jump the queue and please state your full name. Um, I don't think we'll be using cold today. All right, so um, a little bit about document status just because something's in the repo. Doesn't mean that it's been adopted. Uh, we use a call for adoption for that. Um, and within editor's drafts, uh, if something doesn't have consensus, it could have a note to that effect. Um, and we try to also uh, bring things to the working group and put the discussions uh, into the GitHub issues. So uh, we've had a very nasty bug or series of bugs going around. And so a lot of people have been very sick for the last couple of weeks. And we like to wish them good well. Uh, to get well soon, and among those is Harold, Peter, and I think Samir. Anyone else caught that thing? Hopefully not. Uh, but anyway, rest up, and Harold will be back to us hopefully in a, in a week or two. And I know uh, Peter, I think Peter and Samir are here, but anyway, take care of yourselves. All right, so here's what's on the agenda today. Uh, it's pretty time challenged meeting, so we're going to be pretty religious about sticking to the Time allocations. First is a grab bag of a whole bunch of different issues. Then we have Peter on RTB transport, Peter and Samir on ice controller, uh, Yanni Bar with playout delay, and I, uh, uh, that UN has some extra slides. Hopefully, we'll be good and get to them. I, I don't know how how easy that's going to be. All right. So the grab bag, uh, Florent, PR one forty seven. All right. Yeah. So as I presented uh, the proposal a few interims ago um, about adding a codec selection API, um, we failed to mention that it uh, could also be used for audio encodings. So I just want to make it clear that it will also be used uh, for audio for simulcast audio for whichever user agent ever implements it uh, if necessary and all that so that's about it the examples were about simulcast video mixed codec simulcast video but audio is also of course concerned since this is a generic field that is shared by both audio and video encoding if you have any objections, please uh, uh, mention them now or on the pull request. And yeah, that's it. Uh, Yeniva? Uh, yes, I uh, just want to call out, I don't think anyone's planning to implement simulcast for audio. Um, but I think um, the interesting part here is probably more that the, there's a second use case uh, covered by this API, which is to change codecs without renegotiation. So I wanted to make sure that was called out uh, because I think it might be useful for for that, uh, even for audio. But I'm not an audio expert, so. Yes, uh, absolutely. It's for simulcast and non-simulcast. Non-simulcast being simulcast with one layer, special case simulcast. So um, it should work both uh, in the same phase. No, and, there shouldn't be any surprises there. And just to be clear, so if, if people use this API, uh, what codecs can they pick from? All the codecs supported by the user agents. 
Uh, or can they go outside of the game? negotiated uh, envelope? Uh, no. And if right. you wanted to do that, then we will need new APIs. For example, I don't want to do that. that no. going to be other proposals from other people. For example, I don't know, creating an Opus codec with different um, FMTP parameters that people want who could create new things. But that is out of the scope of this. We want to create, we want to use existing codecs that are supported. That's it. Thanks. Peter. All right. So, uh, what do we have uh, for the notes? Um, uh, I guess approval, but can't have to be within the negotiated envelope and also doesn't uh, introduce simulcast for audio. That a summary? Well, I don't uh, think... yeah. Okay. Unless anyone objects, I will <laughs> say no objection, but that uh, um, simulcast for audio is out of scope. Yeah, uh, Peter has uh, raised his hand. Also, uh, yeah, I just I felt like the the question and answer was ambiguous, at least to me, whether or not the if somebody negotiates codex A and B, but the browser supports C, and then you say C, what what happens? Do you send C or does it blow up? It blow up. If you uh, you will get an error if you okay. negotiate A and B. Uh, and you try to select C, there will be an error. This is part of the pull request. Um, okay. Call set parameters get an error. The parameters don't change, and then you can uh, call set parameters again with valid parameters. And that's part of the contract with set parameters. It has to be within the negotiated envelope. Either from there or from our transceiver also. Okay, right. Okay, uh, Tipo. Yes, we have another issue in statistics where we have something defined on outbound RTP, but not on inbound RTP. In particular, we have that for RTX, where we have retransmitted by its sent, but nothing corresponding on inbound RTP. For FAC, it's a similar story. We have on inbound RTP FAC packets received, but we don't have the same thing on outbound RTP. Also for FAC, we do not have the FAC bytes received, so we can calculate the FAC bitrate, which is important, for example, for FlexFAC support. So the proposal is to add the missing things listed on the slide, and then mark the issue as ready for PR and merge once we have at least one implementation supporting that. Any questions? Are there any objections to this? Hi, um, I think I'm on the queue. So no objection specifically, but I think in the issue, uh, there was discussion of only adding some of these, right? And the slide is asking for more than what was an issue. Was there, this, can... was there a change of heart? Um, well, I initially didn't have an implementation for the FAC counters, mm -hmm. but now I do. Okay. Yeah, I think my only concern would be that what about the stats is in Canada the recommendation, so that there would be, uh, and I think it was also discussed that normally if stats are not implemented, we put them in provisional stats instead. And so, so but you're saying that you will be providing implementations, one implementation for these. Is that right? Correct. OK. Yes. And if I don't manage to, then we put them into provisional stats. All right. I, I don't have any immediate objection uh, in that case. OK. Uh, can we um, get a summary for the notes, Henrik? Summary is no no objection. Uh, you're free to sub, uh, submit a PR, and if if there's an implementation, we merge it to WebRTC stats. If there's not an implementation, we'll merge it to the provisional. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, thank you. All right. Uh, so I have uh, an issue 146. Um, so you know, we've been talking about how to expose decode errors and software fallback, and Henrik uh, filed an issue. And we did we discussed this in the media working group uh, last week. Um, and a useful suggestion was made by Eugene, uh, which is that it would be helpful to distinguish between a data error and a resource problem. 
And what a data error is, is if you feed an encoded chunk to a decoder that, and that can't be decoded. And the reason this happens often is because hardware decoders are more strict than software decoders. So it, it's usually a, a spec violation in some way, but a software decoder doesn't error on it, but the hardware decoder will. Um, and so it, that in that situation, you have to fail over to software because it's probably going to recur. Um, and But uh, the developer needs to capture the bitstream and investigate the interop issue. Like, for example, uh, it could be some something that typically a software encoder is doing that the hardware encoder a decoder can't handle uh, but there's nothing there's nothing to show the user because there's nothing they can do about it on the other hand a resource problem is quite different because the hardware decoder becomes unavailable and it could have been because it was allocated to another application or maybe the gpu crashed or something like that um, in this situation the developer would do something different like they would tell the user, hey, another application is affecting your performance or is, or is using the, the hardware resources, please quit that other thing. Um, and then it might be able to re reacquire it, or if it's a GPU crash, maybe you need to reboot or something. So anyway, this is the approach uh, that Eugene's going to try to implement in Web Codex. Um, it's not 100% foolproof that you can always figure out where it's a data error versus a resource problem, but um, anyway, that's that's what we're going to try to do, um, and that's my recommendation here. Uh, so, what what do people think of this approach? Trying to focus on differentiating these two things. Can't see you in the queue. Oh, UN, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So for. Data error is already handled by the user agents. So the user agent can uh, detect a data error and then call back to software without the web application to do anything. So that seems that seems good as is. And that's uh, actually something that is done, for instance, uh, in Safari in some cases, where SVC is not supported by hardware, and we fall, fall back to software. And the web application has no, no API to actually do the switch. And I do not see why the web application should uh, should be notified of of an event that the user agent can uh, do the the right uh, the right thing without the help of the web application. Um, for resource problem, it seems a bit similar to uh, this, this page is using like uh, intensive CPU um, uh, and at least in Safari we have a banner uh, that is a Safari UI that tells the user that that this web page is using like a, very intensive uh, resources, and if they want the, um, the device to to run in smooth, more smoothly, then they can close the the page. So again, there, since uh, it might be another applications that is actually that ha actually have the resource being hooked, uh, maybe the user agent might be able to know which applications and might provide better information than the web application. So I, I'm not sure how the web application can. Uh, help the user uh, more than what the user agent can do there to uh, fix the resource problem. So uh, I would tend to wait for a media working group to settle on this issue. And then uh, once the media working group uh, has settled on this issue, then we can uh, look at what they, they did and try to to uh um, to do what this, we, this is what, we can do. This is what's gonna that you this is what Eugene's gonna try to implement. Uh, coming out of the media working group discussion. Wait, Florent? I think in the first case of a data error, there's also the case where the software decoder can also not be able to uh, decode the data if you right. have um, data that is bogus. Um, and that's something that needs to be also handled. Uh, right. Yeah, so you're saying you need, it's not just knowing that there's a data error, you need to know uh, whether, uh, what, what what decoder uh, had the problem. Yeah, uh, in, in some cases, it might be something that is recoverable by a uh, software encoder. Um, right. And which is, in which case it's great, sometimes it might be uh, interesting to know for the application that the hardware decoder is having issues with potentially well constructed data, but then if you run into issues or specific codec, 
maybe the application will want to do something different, switch to different codec that is better supported by the current hardware, um, or maybe accept a software fallback, which might be fine. Um, and having that kind of information would be great for the application. And have automatic fallback is not necessarily um, the perfect solution in every case. Uh, yeah, Nibar? Yes, I, I think um, I must have had a question I think was answered that uh, just because there's a data error, if it's recoverable, then I don't see, I agree with you and doesn't seem a, a reason for the application to be involved. If, but if, so yeah, but thank you for, for clarifying there might be uh, different cases where uh, the, it, so it was unclear to me whether the only option is to fall back to software in these cases, if that's the subset we're talking about or other type of data errors. I see there were two proposals in the issue. One was on data decode error and the, the, other, the other one was on software fallback. So I think we just should be clear about which problem which problem we're trying to solve. Yeah, they're they're related though, because uh yeah, because you fall back because you're 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 having a problem. Okay. Uh uh can I, I raise my hand earlier? Okay. Uh, yeah. I think these issues were were uh, originally filed because uh, I mean in this discussion we've talked about <clears throat> hardware errors are something we can uh, recover from because we can fall back to software but uh, the problem is that the application prefers to use the better resources than falling back to software uh, and it's it's of course arguable whether hardware is always better but the, the problem is that when we are not we, we're excluding the option to change codec and we're excluding the option to change uh, codec configurations when we hide this information from the right, application right, right. and i don't see what's been discussed here i don't see an attempt to try to solve this so i'm not sure what mark as ready for pr means <clears throat> Well, if you were to able to distinguish between the data and resource problem, then you have the you have provided information to the application that it could use to make those decisions. Are you proposing that we do have events? The yeah, two you have an event that provides that focuses on trying to make a distinction between those two things. Oh, okay, so then you would allow the application to change codec, for example. Yeah, well, it would have the information that it could decide, hey, um, you know, as an example, I have a data error on a hardware encoder, uh, but my application can't stand software. It's just performance is going to be too bad. So okay, the, the then I think codecs might be the only thing then left. Then I think uh, this is a good direction. I. I was afraid the 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 outcome of this discussion was to not tell the application anything because the the browser can just fall back and do whatever it wants. Yeah, in media working group, the 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 goal is is to improve the error handling so that they would have potentially have this information available. Um, so they would they would get it out of web codex. Anyway, um. So, I mean, just to be clear, this is under investigation. So, so uh, Eugene is trying to implement this for Web Codex. Not sure he can he can he can do it reliably. Um, it's not not perfect. Um, so, Jan over here, I raised my hand earlier. Yeah. Uh, just wanted to mention also the privacy issue, uh, which is why I think it makes sense to wait for to see how the media working group handles that first. Well, like I said, it's already been, this is, the discussion's already had, and one of the reasons is you don't need to know as much information in this approach, just is it data or is it resource? Um, and that's, the, the question is, what, what would the application do with the info? It doesn't really need more info about what it was, um, just, just is it a data or is it a resource problem? Uh, yeah, if this, follow, is, if this follows the media working group, I think that might have. Yeah, but anyway, uh, the point is that it there's investigation going on there, but it's it's in this general direction to figure out what uh, what can be provided. Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, what do you have for the notes, uh, Henrik? So, so for the notes, should I say that? Um, well, 
so it's it's under investigation um i mean my general feeling is that we don't want to expose uh privacy speaking information unnecessarily right but that there is is there some positive feeling about moving in in the direction of exposing as data or resource and keep it vague uh, right. but to Just, wait for uh, wait for the media working group to come to a conclusion does that make sense yeah that's so, uh, hesitation yeah, I, I but, um, waiting for media working group and what okay. not not overselling the fact that there's a desire to leak some privacy information there, there's no desire at, at least there's no consensus for uh, leaking private uh, well, information, but uh, media work, waiting for media group. I, I, I think there's consensus there, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, the the question is, uh, it's not clear exactly how this data versus resource would be exposed. One way is to just have a different error uh, for those two two different things. There's no additional information being exposed. You're going to get an error in media in web codecs either way. But the question is, would it be maybe a little bit different kind of error, like an operation error versus an encoding error? Um, anyway, there'll be more info coming. Okay, thanks. Okay. But is is there I, the, the proposal mark as ready for PR? PR sounds like we don't have a consensus. The consensus is to wait for the media working group, or do we have consensus for this direction? I don't, I'm not sure what to write in my notes. Well, I don't know that, um, I mean, if someone wants to provide the effort, we have people who file PRs without filing issues. So uh, I don't know that we necessarily need consensus for someone to do, what, do the work. Um, but I also don't think that the working group needs to be on the hook for having agreed to writing a PR, right? Okay. okay. So All right, I think Peter has uh, said we, uh, Got to we got to move on. Okay. All right. Next slide. All right. Uh, oops. All right. All right. Uh, this one is issue 170, incompatible SVC metadata. Uh, the incompatibility is between web codecs and uh, encoder transform. So um, anyway, I, I wanted to try to spend a few minutes describing. Um, what has been proposed for the SVC metadata in web codecs and why? Um, there's a, the, the basic issue has to do with spatial scalability and, and what you need in the metadata to be able to handle things. Um, and the problem is that dropping spatial layers is easy, but adding them back is not easy. Um, and the reason it's not easy is because of the dependencies and the way spatial scalability works. Um, and let me show a, a, a slide. Um, so this is uh, L2T2, so two temporal layers, two spatial layers. And in um, this situation, basically, uh, there's uh, at time T2, a spatial layer gets dropped. It could be dropped by the SFU or it could be dropped by the sender. Um, and once that happens, if the receiver receives the next spatial frame, which is S1, T1 at time three, that frame will not be decodable because the dependency uh, that's that's there didn't get received for some reason. So another example is, but the dependencies alone are not sufficient to figure out if the frame is decodable. So here's an example where uh, the spatial layer gets dropped at time zero, uh, but at time two, the spatial layer is received. Well, that's not decodable because it, it didn't get the spatial frame at time zero that it depends on. Um, and at time three, another spatial layer is received. That's not decodable, even if time two was received. Because again, the time zero uh, dependency of the dependency is not resolved. Um, another problem that can happen is even if um, all of the frames are received and nothing gets dropped, um, you still can have an issue with what's known as the decode target. So, for example, say you have a a mobile device receiving this stuff, um, and it it doesn't have the screen resource uh, to or the uh, to handle, for example, 4K at 60 frames a second. Well, it could be getting all these frames, so the bandwidth might be available to send it all this stuff, 
but it, it's not within the decode target that it can handle. So um, the receiver could still be dropping all of these all of these frames that it's getting, um, even if all the dependencies are met. So this this kind of describes what information you need to get need to have that goes in the metadata um, to to make the right decisions both in the uh, SFU and in the receiver. Um, so the the point here is the receiver needs to figure out if a frame is decodable, and to do that it needs not just the dependencies but an unbroken chain of dependencies, and it doesn't want to calculate that dependencies on the fly. It needs to know that in the frame because it, it basically would have to go and, and build a chain and you'd have you know potentially hunt dozens of receivers building a chain that could have been sent along with a frame. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. And also the receiver needs to quickly determine not only is the receive frame decodable, but also is it necessary for the desired resolution of frame rate or decode target? Okay, so now uh, we get to what's in RTC encoded video frame metadata. Um, the problem is it it does have dependencies, but it doesn't include the chains, and also it doesn't include the decode targets. So for that reason, the information isn't sufficient to support spatial scalability. Um, also, it's incompatible with Web Codex in terms of the way it way it's done. In Web Codex, you have an SVC dictionary, which is a sub dictionary. Uh, currently, this only has temporal layer ID because. Spatial scalability has not yet been implemented in uh, in Web Codex, and the process in Web Codex is to wait until we have an implementation to put this stuff in. Um, so we do have a PR though for Web Codex. We did discuss this previously in the WebRTC Working Group. The advice here was to submit a Web Codex PR, bring it back. Uh, we now have a PR. It's 654, and this is what the proposal looks like. Put in the chain links, uh, as well as the decode targets. So all the info is there. Um, also, there's a little bit of a difference between what we call frame number and frame ID. They're not quite the same thing. Frame number is much smaller. Um, it's actually, it, it's an unsigned long, but it's actually um, in AB1, it's only six, roughly 16 bits because that's all you need for, for dependencies. Um, so uh, anyway, we had a discussion in the media working group and the big question was, what's the state of implementation in Chromium? Uh, Peter investigated it. I don't know, Peter, could could you say just, is there a, a bite-sized uh, summary of what you found? Uh, I'd have to go check my notes real quick. It, you... I think what you found was a, there was no single codec that implemented all of this stuff. Is that accurate? Well, I remember AV1 doesn't have any implementation, but uh, VP8, VP9, and well, VP8 and H.264 had limited because they don't right. support a lot of this stuff. But VP9 seemed pretty uh, complete. But I don't think there's anything in there for chains. I, right. I'm going to have to go check my, my notes. Right. So anyway, so VP9 probably has the most, but uh, not the chain portion of it. So, um, so the big question that came up in Media Working Group was, hey, why is this stuff in ENCODE transform? Uh, has it been implemented? Do we, as a dependency, spatial index, and temporal index, are they implemented? Uh, and if not, should that stuff be removed until we have a, a complete implementation that can actually test this out? Uh, people know if, uh, if they're, yeah. Laura? So um, I know that the temporal and spatial index are implemented, okay. but it might be correct dependent and also depending on the AV1 dependency descriptor. Um, so you can have that information stored in the uh, bitstream for, uh, well, the frame descriptor for VP8, for VP9, and you will get that info. You should get that information just fine. It's not in the bitstream directly for AV1 that we decode, but we require the AV1 one dependency descriptor. So if you provide it, you should get most of the information somehow, I believe. From my recent limited testing, uh, I think that the behavior that we have um, doesn't mean there are no bugs or anything like that, but I think that's the constant. 
and I do have some tests that are relying on this for SVC uh, implementation in Chrome. So very confident that it works in some cases, at least uh, internally, maybe some Chromium deep web RTC issues. Okay, uh, so we, we've got this incompatibility between web codecs and uh, and uh, RTC encoded uh, frame metadata. So what what's the uh, you know we went ahead and did a PR. What, what's the solution to fixing the incompatibilities? Thorn, do you have a suggestion? Uh, not at the moment. I need to get uh, familiarized better with uh, the web codec side of things. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I guess we'll just move on. Um, okay, uh, Henrik. Uh, yes, so get stats. Uh, in get stats, we recently added the, the following audio capture related metrics to the RTC audio source stats. Uh, the source stats is uh, a stats object that's only present when a media stream track is attached to a sender. Uh, so all of these metrics was added to this existing stat objects with the clause only only applicable if the media source is backed by an audio capture device. Um, the reason we want these capture device is uh, or these metrics is that they allow to calculate uh, quality metrics that are not available elsewhere. Uh, meaning that uh, the bullet point list shows the metrics. Uh, you can cal calculate glitches by taking the, the ratio of uh, dropped samples and uh, total samples, or you can calculate the average delay um, by taking the, the capture delay divided by the number of uh, samples, the total capture delay. Uh, next slide. And so, so these were merged into the stats spec, but then the, this issue was filed. And uh, as previous discussions, this have, these have all been marked feature at risk because, uh, so bullet point one is get user media frequency used outside of WebRTC. So it seems like a bad fit to have these metrics in get stats inside WebRTC. Uh, second point is about um, the spec talks about audio samples, but we should be talking about audio frames. Uh, and this is actually just a terminology difference, what the stat spec says, uh, means when it says audio frames uh, or audio samples is actually the same thing as the rest of the world means when they say audio frames. Uh, it's clarified in the term terminology section. Uh, and a third point was that it's not clear uh, why our audio may be dropped, but this relates to uh, when processing of the audio samples uh, is not in a timely manner. Anyway, the main problem, I think, other than clarifying uh, things here is that it's get stats is a bad location for these metrics uh, when they belong to the track. So the proposal, uh, or, or what I want to get a, a sense of uh, uh, direction here is if it's if it's okay to work on a, a proposal a PR to move these to the media stream track. Um, we did have video capture metrics added to media stream track in WebRTC or media capture extensions. So I'd like to do the same thing with these audio capture metrics. So point one is that makes sense. The second point is naming nets. Yuan? Yes, that makes sense. I think it can be used like in media recorder in other cases. So we should definitely do that. Uh, as of names, I, I don't have uh, any strong, uh, and uh, in the interest of time, I will not go there. So for one, let's go. Okay. And Johnny Wei? Yeah, I think this is the right direction because having to create a peer connection to get some of these stats uh, is always a little awkward. Hey, nice. 
Uh, do you have any opinion about if we should use one and the same get stats method for all metrics, in which case maybe just rename existing one to get stats? Or should I create a separate get captures audio capture stats method? Is that for me? And just if you have an opinion. Uh yeah, I was always a little surprised why we didn't just call it get stats, to be honest. I did propose that actually. <laughs> anyway, right. it seems like I it's there's we can no, bike <laughs> and I, I note I, I'll add, uh, mention in the notes that there seems like to be approval of, of this direction and to be to continue with the PRs. Okay, next slide. Uh, I don't know how much uh, we want to go over here, but I was mostly just going to motivate the, uh, this PR and the encoded transform spec. Um, there was a bit of confusing history of uh, I took over from a uh, previous PR 137 from last year that was abandoned. Uh, so some of the historic discussion maybe got lost. Um, but yeah, uh, very briefly, the motivation is for web apps that are doing both a raw transform and an encoded transform it's super useful to be able to align the uh, encoded frame with the war frame that previously um, sort of corresponds to it. Um, and this is achieved in the web codex uh, spec by having a timestamp that matches on both sides. Unfortunately, the timestamp that we have in the RTC encoded frame ended up being the RTP timestamp. So the, uh, the PR is uh, proposing adding a presentation timestamp. I know there's uh, some discussion on naming there. Uh, yeah, it is unfortunate that the timestamp sort of unqualified name is already taken. But uh, that's kind of where we are. Um, any quick thoughts, Peter? Oh, I was just being the timekeeper. Ah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, sorry, everyone. Uh, Yanova? You put it this way, are there objections to what Tony's proposing? I think uh, overall we're supportive of the, this direction, but uh, just calling out my last comment there about the name uh, bike shedding, if you will, is that uh, there is a note on RTC encoded video frame, a comment that says uh, we'll eventually reuse or extend right. the equivalent defined in web codex. So assuming we can solve the naming issues, um, it, it seems like we're at a crossroads here if we're still going to do that. Um, I'm curious what the working group feels about redefining timestamp. It's becoming a bigger and bigger problem, Yanivar. I, I, I would agree. Um, I, I think this is, we've been, we're heading down a road where we're create, recreating web codex and that's gonna be a real problem. But yeah, no objection that we need it, but the name needs to be figured out. Uh, is just discussion on the PR the best place for that, do we think? I guess there's not really much other option. Thanks. Thanks. All right. So we're going to hand this over to Peter. Did you want to do the first slide, Bernard? Oh, uh, there is no. Oh. OK, well, this one is the first. Sorry, I uh, missed the, oh. the, the one after this one. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so uh, WebRC combines media and transport. And sometimes it's a good thing and sometimes not such a good thing. Um, the good thing is that it, if it just it works to do what you want to do, it's the simplest way to go about it. But um, there's a whole bunch of cons that can come with it. Um, it as an example, some of the things we're talking about here um, in, in web codecs are, are different in WebRTC for reasons that aren't always clear. Uh, it's difficult. If something can't be expressed in SCP, it's difficult to do even though it uh, could be done in, at the lower level, like trying to control encoding parameters or differential resistance or custom resilience or monitoring some of the hardware acceleration things we've been just talking about. Um, <clears throat> difficult to support uh, bleeding edge codecs that could be bring your own codec or it could even be stuff that's already supported in the system um, like AGBC or a codec that requires a new RTCP message, which is already in the system like DP9 or AB1. Um, don't currently support layer refresh. So, Peter. All right. So, as Bernard was mentioning, uh, there's a lot of 
inflexibility because WebRTC has the media and the transport so tightly coupled. And so what if we chop that in half into the media part and the transport part? Next slide. What it would look like is on the media side, you would have encode and decode. And on the transport side, you would have RTP packets being, and RTCP packets being just sent and received. Next slide. And then the app sits somewhere in the middle. Next slide. And an API between these could look something like what we've talked about needing for encoded streams, where uh, the media side of things might have feedback, such as I need a keyframe, and the app might be able to tell it, here are the bit rates I want you to um, use. And on the transport side, uh, the transport might say, here's an estimated bit rate. So, um, Today we'd like to focus, or I'd like to focus on the side on the right, the transport side. You may have noticed that the side on the left looks a lot like web codecs. So we kind of already have the side on the left um, solved to a degree. And the question is, can we do the side on the right with RTP? Uh, next slide. So imagine for a minute that we define something called an RTP transport that is able to send and receive RTP and RTC packets. Uh, these packets are encrypted with SRTP and RTCP. It's congestion controlled, just like it is now, um, probably with transport CC and Goog CC. Um, the sender, the API for sending would be um, that you stream packets in, and then those packets go out on the wire. And then on the receive side, when the packets come in, you get some event of packets, whether we use events or what WG streams, uh, I don't have to get too in the weeds about right now, but just imagine you have a way to get packets in and out. Um, we can make sure this thing supports workers. And uh, if the left side of the picture I had before was web codecs, it should work well with this right side uh, that is RTP transport. And ideally, you should be able to construct one of these things separate from a peer connection which would require a DTLS peer connection, which at the moment does require a peer connection, but um, we, can, we can fix that. So next slide. Um, like I was saying, if you uh, want to make it so that you don't need a peer connection at all, we could come up with a way to construct a DTLS transport, which would require a nice transport. We'll be talking about that uh, later later today. But um, even right now, if we had such an RTP transport that could be constructed from, an R from a DTLS transport, you could do it by constructing a peer connection that only has data channels, get the DTLS transport out of it, and stick that in the RTP transport. So it is, it is doable even now. <clears throat> um, so if we combined web codecs with such a thing, RTP transport, then the application would be free to do all of its own uh, packetization and jitter buffer and rate adaptation and everything everybody's always asked for. Um, we could add as well some API that would represent, say, an audio jitter buffer. That is something not included in web codecs, um, but it might be nice for an application to use the audio jitter buffer built into the browser. But for now, uh, I'm just focusing on the uh, RTP transport. Next slide. If you squint, you will notice this looks a bit like web transport, at least when you're using datagrams with web transport, except that uh, this can be peer-to-peer, -peer, whereas web transport cannot be peer-to-peer. -peer. And this would have built-in uh, latency-sensitive congestion control, whereas web transport currently has that as an unsolved problem. And of course, this can interop with existing RTP endpoints, which web transport doesn't. Next slide. Uh, if we go through the NV use cases, um, basically, if we had a combination of web codecs and this theoretical RTP transport, it would solve all of the <laughs> NV use cases that I've listed here. So uh, things like being able to um, receive audio and video without constructing a sender object. Obviously, you can receive whatever you want with the RTP transport without uh, creating RTP transceivers. Next slide. Um, or in the case where you want to control um, 
what is sent and received in relation to RTCP and header extensions without negotiation. Well, there is no negotiation, at least not uh, in the sense of peer connection SDP. Obviously, the application can do whatever it wants to decide what it sends and receives. Next slide. If you wanted to control the RTX in red and FEC, uh, a mechanism like the RTP transport would have very low level control for doing that. In fact, the application could do its own FEC if it wanted to. Then it could decide what packets it wants to send. It's very low level. So uh, this would be, this uh, requirement would be met. Next slide. Um, when it comes to uh, being able to control the rate adaptation, basically, then, as I mentioned, the RTP transport would have a signal coming back to the application saying, here's the current estimated uh, bit rate. So use it how you want. And as long as you stay below that, you should be able to uh, keep latency low. Next slide. Um, NV38 does not have consensus. OK. Um, well, if we added a low level uh, audio jitter buffer, we should have controls like this. But obviously, if the application does its own jitter buffer in between web codecs and uh, RTP transport, then it can do whatever it wants with the jitter buffer, uh, including controlling this delay. Next slide. Um, if an application wanted to do something like an SFU, which is basically uh, what is being described here, then obviously it could create multiple RTP transports to other peers and forward packets between them, just like an SFU does. Next slide. Um, yeah, you don't have to create an encoder. You can just forward things or send and receive things. Next slide. Sorry, uh, having to remember what these are myself on the spot. Yeah, so the uh, application be control, be able to control the metadata as it sends and receives because it gets low level control. Next slide. And finally, we get to the point where uh, you get an idea of what the web IDL for such an RTP transport could be. Um, again, we could go down the road of something like web transport does with what WG streams, or we could go down the road of what web codecs does with with events and callbacks. Um, here, I just presented events without what WG streams. So imagine that this thing has a constructor that takes a detailless transport, and then the main RTP send and receive is you have a method where you call send RTP packet, and then there's an event that's like, hey, you received an RTP packet. For RTCP, you have a send RTCP packet, and then you have an event that says, hey, there's an RTCP packet. And then if the target bit rate changes, you get an event that fires, and then there's an attribute for the target send rate. So next slide. Uh, here's a very simple example. If you somehow constructed a peer connection with negotiation of SDP for ICE DTLS and SCTP, then you could get the DTLS transport, construct the RTP transport, and then you'd have send of uh, RTP packets or send of RTCP packets. Next slide. And uh, if you wanted to listen to the event to know to reallocate bit rates for rate control, you could do that. Next slide. Um, so one thing that I've mentioned that we could discuss in more detail is the media side of things. I think that uh, web codecs uh, is a great fit, but again, it lacks the jitter buffers and perhaps packetization. So if we wanted to make it easy for applications to take the output of web codecs and packetize for sending or depacketize and do jitter buffer on the receiving, we could expose uh, some additional objects uh, for doing packetization or jitter buffers. I have written some designs for that, but focus right now is the RTP transport. And uh, so the question is if every other people in the working group agree that this is a good direction to go where we can uh, give applications more low level control by exposing a transport object. Uh, Yoni Bar. Yeah, so. Um I, I don't believe an issue, so I welcome opening an issue so we can discuss this on GitHub. Uh, so I don't have to give my first feedback on YouTube, but I'll try. I, I feel like this, uh, what you mentioned, let me step back. NV use cases kind of predates web transport in a way. So I think we have a problem there that a lot of the use cases 
and Envy imagined a WebRTC 2.0. I think a lot of those use cases uh, have since been met by web transport. And you also mentioned there's overlap with web transport here. So, uh, and the things you list are actually not use cases, they're requirements for use cases. So uh, as far as I can tell, the use case here was mentioned, uh, like bring your own codec was one, but it just, just like, how is this, this feels like one the one way media, media use cases that we already have a call for a consensus for. So it feels like I've already objected to this. Uh, you haven't. There are the the ones that were uh, consensus mm -hmm. have already been a link to use cases and end to use cases, and they're already been have working group consensus. So that the slides describe which ones mm -hmm. have objections and which one don't. But the uh, ones that that weren't linked as non consensus are working group consensus items. All right. Well, in any case, uh, Firefox has just implemented web transport. It's available in Firefox nightly. We welcome everyone to go and test it. That means there's now two implementations for web transport. And uh, I would like to ask the working group, how many low-level APIs do we need? And pushing back a little bit on the slide that says, uh, everyone has wanted to do their own packetization, jitterbot buffer, and rate adaptation. Uh, so far, uh, if that is true, welcome to come and try out web transport. I, so far, ad adoption hasn't been indicative of that large an interest. So I would like to push back and also Specifically, uh, it seems a, a bit early to discuss web IDL, um, uh, and some of the concerns that we've already we spend a lot of effort keeping video uh, video track generator off a of main thread, for example, and this would give main thread exposure. We spend a lot of time in web transport to provide streams based access, and here we have a method to send RTP and events to get RTCP. So a lot of these feel like uh, our previous concerns of the working group are not being met. So that's my feedback. Okay, Yuen? Yeah, um, uh, I think that, um, so we see uh, a lot of people uh, trying to push a lot of stuff in a code transform to do all of their customization and, and this is wrong. And this approach is trying to to clean up that uh, that mess somehow. So that that's good. Um, there's a desire to have a nice transport. Then you can have a detailed transport. Then you can have like a, a web transport like uh, approach where you you separate both. So that's that's also good from um, from that perspective. So I, I think it's the right approach. Uh, the, the, the um, question that John Ivar is raising in terms of use cases is is good. Uh, are there sufficient use cases to warrant the effort to implement that? And that's uh, that's a good question. Um, and we should spend some time there. But um, once we gather uh, enough information in terms of uh, use cases yeah. and we're like, yeah, we want to do it, then uh, it's that kind of approach that we should take. Yeah. Uh, Florent? I think that's an interesting approach that probably needs to be discussed more. Um, to respond to Yanivar's concern about overlaps with uh, web transport, um, I don't believe that web transport will uh, work in this in most cases that involve peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, um, since uh, web transport only works with connection to a server and uh, not between two browser instances. Uh, there's also um, probably an, I imagine, an interest of keeping the existing infrastructure, all the SFUs that are working right now with RTB packets and that are not uh, based on uh, media of a quick. Randall? Sorry, let me unmute. Um, Hi. Uh, so yes, I mean, <laughs> I think it's interesting. Um, I have some concerns, um, you know, similar to Yanni Bars, but uh, not identical about uh, about this. Um, it does seem like it'd be fairly easy for something to violate uh, bandwidth constraints, um, though perhaps there there would be mechanisms in place to to block that somehow. Uh, 
uh, given this sort of interface. Um, so you have so applications could accidentally cause some problems. Um, the um, it, I mean it there it it does smack me as very being very. It's it's very low level and is inviting applications to basically implement their own implementation of WebRTC and JavaScript, which is possible. It's going to be very hard for people to do this and do it well. I mean, doing it's one thing; doing it well is another thing. Um, that's not so easy, and. Um, I'm you know, a little concerned about that, but I think it's worth discussing in more detail about what this would actually get us, what the use cases this would enable that aren't enabled elsewhere, um, as was mentioned, uh, and what alternatives there might be to uh, this uh, uh, design to meet those use cases. So I think it's worth opening an issue and discussing. Um, I, I have some reservations about about some of the details here and about, you know, uh, about there being some alternatives available. Um, one of the issues with web transport, there are two issues with web transport, one of which Florent just mentioned, which is the fact that it is, and was in the slide, which is that it's only um, uh, uh, client to server at the moment. Sorry, for that, Bernard, did you want to jump in? No, go ahead. So um, it's only client to server at the moment. Um, uh, it's not to say it couldn't be peer to peer, but that would be more additional work and specification required to get there. Uh, the other, the second issue, which I think was also touched on somewhere, is that the, uh, in the slides, which is that the congestion control currently implemented uh, for web transport is not real time friendly. Um, and that could be fixed, however. And there is a, you know, I want real-time compression uh, flag. It's just not implemented by anyone that I know of yet. So, uh, in any case, that's my opinion. Let me uh, quickly just reply to the, uh, three things there. One of them, uh, about web transport, uh, I don't think you'll find someone that's not, or, so, I'm a fan of web transport, uh, and I would like to see it uh, solve the issues of both peer-to-peer -peer and uh, real-time congestion control, and I think it can. Um, but it will never have the same uh, interop with endpoints like uh, Florent was mentioning, and which I also uh, put on my slide. So I think even if web transport becomes everything we want it to be, there will still uh, be reason to have uh, RTP capabilities uh, for web apps. And about the question of re-implementing re libwebrtc, the reason I was earlier mentioning uh, the audio jitter buffer and video jitter buffer, those both jitter buffers, um, and the packetization is that that is the main thing uh, that you're missing that uh, somebody would need to re-implement. The packetization is not so hard, but the jitter buffer certainly is. Uh, Writing a high-quality audio buffer is a is not an easy task, so that's why I do have a proposal for how we could have an API for that. I could bring it to the working group to discuss if you'd like. Um, and also in response to the question of uh, congestion control, uh, part of the detailed um, design I have for this does address the question of. Um, how we keep the application from screwing up congestion control, basically, to make sure that the application can, or the, sorry, the browser can add the uh, mechanisms it needs, both in RTCP feedback and uh, header extension, uh, RTP header extensions, in order to do congestion control without the application uh, screwing things up. So I do think that's a solvable problem. Um, and related to that, which nobody brought up, is uh, the question of uh, SRTP. Uh, sequence number reuse and avoiding that. I do have a solution for that also. So I've, I've thought through this a bit and I can, I'm more than happy to discuss it in great detail, but uh, the overall question is first, like, do we want to have those discussions? So if the answer is yes, then then great. Uh, do you want to respond, Randall? Your hands up. Yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah, 
Steve. Those are, that's good. Um, the one thing I would like to say, just expanding a little bit, is that all things being equal, I, you know, if I had a choice, I'd prefer to solve this through web transport. Um, and perhaps there are some cases whereby, you know, there might be some, um, you know, you mentioned Flo Florence uh, 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 issue. Um, you know, I, I, I know, I'd rather solve it through a transport if I, if we can. I think that's a cleaner, over, you know, forward-looking solution. But, um, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, I want to see that we're going to get a clear win here that we can't get uh, be doing other work, uh, doing, you know, especially, especially with web transport. And that, you know, the, you know, for the use cases that we're going to decide we care about. Bernard? Uh, yeah, just a comment that uh, the IETF uh, is not going to be using web transport for peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, so RTP over QUIC is being defined with raw QUIC um, using peer-to-peer -peer QUIC, which this working group decided not to work on. Um, so, uh, and in mock, they're discussing whether to use web transport or not. Not clear they will use web transport. They may also go with peer-to-peer -peer QUIC. Um, so, Anyway, that, that decision on where to go for protocols is in the ITF, not in the W3C. And it, it's not clear that web transport will be adopted for that peer peer case. But in any case, uh, web transport would merely be providing a, a, a data channel, so to speak, no pun intended, that we already have a data channel for peer to peer. So the question here is whether there are use cases, peer-to-peer -peer use cases that aren't satisfied by existing technology. That's what I would like to see. I also gave a link in my earlier objection in chat here, uh, issue 100, um, was it 100, where I point out that you can already use the track generator to uh, and existing APIs to send data in this fashion. That doesn't require. So it feels like this is, a, without better use cases, it feels like a premature optimization. So I um, would love to hear uh, reasons why that's not the case. So on the, on the topic of uh, use cases, um, we've been talking about them forever. And we have never gotten around to really making solid proposals for one-way on, one, one APIs for encoded media. Um, and I think that's a shame. I think it's like been far too long. Like people want to, to be able to do things and we're just kind of yeah. talking about talking about talking about talking forever about what the use cases are. And eventually people want us to actually implement something. Well, um, and so what, I, what I'm suggesting is that this RTP transport could be as, when combined with web codex and perhaps an audio jitter buffer uh, could be a solution to all of these things that we've talked about. I, th I think it meets all of the use cases anyone's brought up but um, I am getting tired of talking about use cases. We seems like we never get anywhere. You win. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, so there, there was the, um, prom the promise that web transport uh, would somehow plus web codecs uh, be able to replace uh, WebRTC peer connection in JavaScript, so at least you would be able to to do that, and that that's not re that's not really possible, and uh, people are actually wanting that. Um, so maybe they, they should be more clear, precisely why they they want that, but they they keep con con they keep coming at us to to ask for something like that. So i think that it it would be great to collect all the very precise use cases for that and uh try to solve that in in a, in a clean approach like let, let, let's do a, a transport level api for for rtp if that's really what we want uh, or if there is enough uh use cases in interest instead of um trying to slowly extend things like web web and could transform because that's really not the place where all that stuff should happen. And uh, there is pressure to, to do that at WebRTC and could transform, and that should not be our answer. 
Okay, I think we're out of time for this segment. Uh, but what we'll try to do, I think what UN just described probably is something that would be best done in a, in a needs quite a bit of time, I think. So one of the things we may be thinking about is what to do with TPAC um, relating to this and how to handle um, stuff like this. May not, may not, or we can try uh, future meetings. But thank you. So we're going to move on to the next slot, which is ice controller. Hi, I'm Samir. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and uh, I would like to continue our discussion about uh, WebRDC ice improvements. Uh, if you go to the next slide. So uh, where we were at uh, last time was uh, we had three different proposals for trying to do something like this. Uh, so there was a lot of options. And uh, one of the main feedbacks was th there was quite a lot of API. Can we transplit it into smaller increments? And how do those increments map to use cases? And so that's what uh, Peter and I have been trying to do since uh, the last meeting. What we've done is we've organized uh, all the different proposals into a single proposal. It's got lots of uh, common ground. So uh, we agree on quite a lot of things. There's a few uh, cases where we have uh, multiple ways to do something, but that's something we can uh, discuss. Those are fairly uh, smaller issues. The second thing we've done is split the entire proposal into several smaller increments. Each of those increments adds something significant uh, in terms of capability. So each of those is a good increment to, to implement. And all together, they add up to pretty much anything we would want to do with uh, ice controller, I think. So uh, hopefully those increments make sense. So if you could go to the next slide. Uh, as the entire list of all the increments, I know that's quite a lot. So let me try and go over these in batches. So on the next slide. So the next slide, please. Here's the first batch where we try uh, where the application gets to maintain several candidate pairs control when those get removed or cause some of them to be removed and then the application can select which candidate pair to use for the transport uh, the next slide the ne next increment is to ensure low latency this is by uh, observing the RTTs for different candidate pairs and what states those pairs are in. The next slide. This is about controlling ICE connectivity checks. So there's uh, APIs to control how often uh, connectivity checks are sent, uh, prevent the user agent from automatically sending those, control the timing or the delay, uh, of those checks and then observe when uh, responses are received for checks or when checks are received from the other end. And then the next slide. <clears throat> so this batch is about controlling how local candidates are gathered or regathered if uh, necessary. Uh, next slide. This is around keeping uh, local candidates around, uh, not having them pruned prematurely or causing them to get pruned. Uh, and then the last slide, uh, the next, uh, last batch is about uh, creating an ICE transport without a peer connection and then uh, supporting ICE forking by having a separate gatherer. So Peter can talk uh, more about the API shape itself for these increments. Right, so we tried to break it down into very small increments. Each one of those line items is a slide here with a small uh, addition to the existing API uh, with the exception of perhaps the very last ones. And we put them in what we thought was uh, priority order of what uh, is the most important thing to implement first. So. For preventing candidate uh, pair removal, we actually have two options. Uh, there are only a couple of times when we are pre presenting two options, and that's because um, even though we agreed on almost everything, Samir and I uh, still aren't sure whether we prefer cancelable events or not, or uh, more automatic or more 
direct control. Um, it, we can discuss that as a working group, but uh, for today, you know, just pick the one you like in your mind and then uh, consider the, the proposal as a whole with that one that you like. <laughs> we can discuss which one uh, it could be later. So if it's a cancelable event, then on the ICE transport, there would be an event that indicates that a candidate pair has been removed and then, um, or is proposed to be removed, I guess, because it's cancelable. And then the uh, application can use to cancel that and say, no, don't remove that candidate pair. Whereas in the direct uh, approach, there would be an event to say that a candidate pair got added and then an attribute on that candidate pair would be to say whether it's removable or not. And so if you set that to faults, then it can't be removed. Next slide. Uh, next slide. And then if you want to remove a candidate pair, there's a new method on RTC ICE transport for removing the candidate pair or more than one at a time. Next slide. And if you want to control the selection of a candidate pair, there's a new method on RTCI transport for selecting the candidate pair called set selected candidate pair. Um, now, this is something uh, where you may want to know the state of a particular candidate pair. And so we basically add uh, an event and an attribute to the candidate pair. So yes, we'd have to change the, right? Is it already an interface? I can't remember. One of these objects is currently dictionary. We have to change it to an interface. But um, assuming this one's already an interface, uh, the state would give you something that looks a lot like the current uh, ice state for the entire connection, except this is a per candidate pair state. So that uh, if you had more than one, you'd know which one is uh, connected or, or uh, still checking or whatever. Next slide. Um, it can be often useful to know uh, the RTT or the result of outgoing checks. So we can add an event to the RTCI transport to know when a particular ICE check was sent and a response was received or it timed out. And so um, we might need a better name for that. I apologize for this uh, name here, the ICE check sent and resolved event. Um, but basically, you'd know for a particular candidate pair at what time the check was sent, at what time the response was received it was, and then if it failed, if, why did it fail? That's useful to know. Next slide. Another incremental change would be to control how quickly a particular uh, candidate pair is uh, sending checks, so that if you wanted to have a candidate pair that was like in a background state, that it's only checking every 25 seconds, say, then you just set the interval to every 25 seconds. Or if you want it to be more frequent every second, then you can set it to every second with this attribute. Next slide. If you wanted to um, prevent outgoing checks of particular candidate pairs to get more uh, precise control, um, then again, we have two options, one of them being the cancel event approach and the other being um, the more direct uh, control approach. So with a cancelable event, there'd be an event that says, hey, we uh, propose, uh, the ICE agent proposes sending a check, and then you can cancel that if you want. And the other approach is just whenever you see a nice candidate pair, similar to before, whether it was removable or not, now it's checkable. You just set that to false, and then no um, uh, checks will be sent unless, next slide, you call the send check method. So if you just want to control exactly when checks are sent, you can call send check whenever it is that you want a, a check sent. So this uh, gives more manual control uh, than, than setting the interval, uh, but it's also a little, uh, you know, a little more hands-on. Next slide. Um, sometimes you, it's useful for the application to know when things stop coming in, uh, not just checks, but also other media. And so we add two attributes to let you know the last time a particular uh, check, or last time a check was received or any packet was received, um, so that if a particular candidate pair suddenly has no traffic coming in, uh, then by pulling this uh, value, you would know that it's been 
say over a second, and then you can take some action according to that. Next slide. Now for gathering local candidates, when new network interfaces come up, comes up, this is uh, very useful uh, for uh, mobile situations where Wi-Fi might come and go. Um, and we have two options uh, here, not because it's uh, cancelable events and not cancelable events. It's more uh, how forward compatible we want to be with uh, eventually adding ice forking if we choose to. So uh, if we don't care about ice forking ever happening, then we would put an attribute on the RTC ice transport, basically saying gather continually, uh, which is to say if a new interface shows up, Wi-Fi shows up what we didn't have before, gather candidates for it. Um, if option B, where we want to be compatible with uh, ice forking in the future, then it would be better to put that attribute on a new object called an ice gatherer and then expose the ice gatherer through the transport. And that's because with ice forking, you would want this uh, gather to be shared amongst many transports. So it's almost the same at this level, but I just wanted to point out that either it's within its own object to gather or not, depending on how compatible we want to be with potentially doing ice forking. Next slide. Um, along with gathering candidates when new interfaces come up, there's also the question of if uh, a previous interface, like say Wi-Fi, wasn't working because of say a captive portal not being finished by the user, but now it is, how can the application tell the ICE agent to regather that? Um, and so again, uh, we can either put this directly to the ICE transport or we can put this on the gather, depending on how uh, compatible we want to be with ICE forking. But either way, there's a gather method that basically says regather. And uh, there needs to be some option for either gather all of the network interfaces again, even the ones I'm currently using, or only gather the ones uh, that I'm not currently using, only the ones that failed previously, basically. And so there's a Boolean flag for that. Next slide. Uh, it's often the case that you would, as mentioned, want to prevent the uh, uh, ICE agent from removing local candidates. You want to keep them around. And so here again, we have two options, one of them being a uh, cancelable event. So the ICE transport could say, hey, I propose removing this local candidate. And if it, and then the uh, application could choose to cancel that. Now, it's not always possible. Uh, sometimes uh, the network interface will just go away. And obviously, the local candidates for that network interface are going to go away. And it's not cancelable. But um, if it's just pruning it because uh, no one's using the cellular candidates right now, and it proposes removing them, then you, the application can choose to cancel it or not. Um, with the more direct approach, uh, option B, um, it would be uh, similar to the candidate pair where there's a removable attribute, except now it would be on a localized candidate. Um, and this uh, this is the one that would be an interface instead of a dictionary. Uh, basically, there'd be an event on the either the ice gather or the ice transport, depending on whether we want to be compatible with ice forking. And that object, the object from that event um, or that getter, we do get candidates, um, would have a removable field that could indicate whether it's removable or not. Next slide. And then, of course, if you prevented remove, removal of local candidates, you want to be, to be able to remove them. So um, in a world where we don't want ice forking, or that would be on ice transport, just call remove local candidates. And in a world where we want it compatible with ice forking, that would be on the ice gatherer to say remove candidates. Pretty straightforward either way. Next slide. Uh, now we get into the slightly more complicated ones, uh, the use without peer connection and the um, uh, ice forking, the two last things on the list. So construction without peer connection um, basically, there would need to be a few things that exist at the peer connection level uh, pulled into uh, the ICE transport, in particular, uh, a constructor and a way to tell it to start and uh, a way to tell it to gather with particular fields that exist in the RTC configuration right now, such as the ICE servers and the uh, ICE transport policy. So it's not a lot of stuff. It's, uh, oh, and then the role um, indicating what ICE role. So it's not a lot of things, uh, it's, it's pretty small, but the benefit of this would be that um, 
if we wanted to do something like pass an ICE transport into a web transport constructor to allow for web transport peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, then we would need a way to construct an ICE transport without a peer connection. So that's why we'd, we would want this. Next slide. And the last one is ICE forking. So um, what's funny is actually if we do the previous thing with the ICE gatherer, then ICE forking uh, becomes it just falls out of the API, actually. But if we wanted to do uh, ice forking with peer connection, then we would need a way to pass an ice gatherer into the peer connection. And it would actually be uh, doable with just this one addition to RTC config, assuming that the previous parts of the previous slide were added with the constructor of the ice gatherer. Uh, OK, we've got some hands raised. Can I just get to the? I think there's one more slide I wanted to get to before taking questions. Next slide. Right, so the, the summary here is that uh, we've broken it down into lots of small incremental improvements that are each valuable on their own, independent of the others. So that, for example, if uh, in the next year, a particular browser only felt the need to implement half of them, it could do so without having to implement the whole thing. Um, None of them are particularly difficult to implement or use, uh, with perhaps the exception of the last part where uh, you want to be able to construct this independent of a peer connection. But that's kind of you know, down the list. And uh, it, these do altogether almost everything anyone's ever asked for to be able to do with ICE. So uh, one more slide. OK, so the main question here, there's my other minor questions below, but the top one I want is the one that I want to ask, which is oh no, go back. Don't scare everyone with that one. Uh, is the top question there, which is does the working group want to pursue this direction of uh, this unified thing with this incremental approach? It's just what people asked for last time we discussed this. <laughs> All right, who's in the queue first? Bernard. Um, well, I, I had a question just about this, the ice forking thing. Uh -huh. So when you're passing a gather and configuration, I guess that's assuming you're max bundled, so you only need one gatherer. Yeah, um, I was kind of assuming that if you're willing to, if, if you're going to be doing ice forking, you're willing to do max bundle. Otherwise, you'd have to like pass in more than one gatherer. And, OK, that's it. Uh, Yanni Bar. Uh, yes, so, so I do think we want to go in this direction. Um, I do have some, uh, but when it comes down to, um, and I know there was a lot of different things, uh, but r regarding the question of cancelable events, I'm not necessarily opposed to cancelable events. I think their semantics may make sense in cases where you're obviously trying to intercept or prevent something the ICE agent is doing today. I think that might be a valuable pattern. On the other hand, if uh, if the application might want to remove a pair, uh, not in reaction to something, but on its own, then I agree with Peter's uh, method-based API is better. So I think. Um, if the two of you can agree on where each pattern uh, works, I think uh, either, you know it might be a mix. And my my other feedback just is the details. It's at the detail level. I do struggle to see the picture a bit, so I would wonder. It's hard. To, it's hard from the web IDL to imagine. I'm trying to it's like imagining a meal based on looking at the recipe. Uh, it's. I'm wondering how the JavaScript would look. Uh, when using all these WebIDL APIs. So, uh, so so apologies if I don't have a clear view right now. But it seems to me that um, uh, I, I did see a lot of defining of custom events. So I, I wanted to I pointed out in chat, too, that that seems to go. There's a W3C design pattern that's, that seems to want to be to prefer, prefer using plain events. And here we have. Uh, so I would only imagine we would need to create an interface custom event if there wasn't already a, a, a pairs member, for example. 
So that might be an, an artifact of trying to keep these separate. Yeah. So maybe. Yeah. So uh, almost all of the events here were on the cancel load event approach. Uh, the, the, the exception, I think, was getting the RTT value. Um, and it might be possible. Yeah. It might be possible to instead have an a uh, an attribute that's like latest uh, RTT or latest check result or something. Um, right. So perhaps we could get around that one. But, but overall, I, overall, yeah, I think uh, it's a good direction. So if if the discussion moves from this is the right approach to let's discuss cancel events versus not, that'd be great. <laughs> That's the second question on the slide. So, uh, but we'll let other people. Hang in. You in? You in? It's it's a it's a long list of uh, interfaces, so I, I cannot I cannot sign on all interfaces there. Uh, but it, it's good to have a, a path forward that seems uh, pretty clear. I'm hoping that the first um, API bits are the ones that uh, developers will start using first, uh, because then we, we can start prototyping and ship, shipping things first, seeing that there's uh, interest, and and then. It helps also motivating uh, for all the remaining stuff. So I'm hoping that yeah, the first three there will will add great value. And um, so if so, let, yeah, let's start digging into that and let's start uh, being nitpicky about the API and uh, and the design and so on. Yeah, um, Samir and I, when we made this order, we basically were thinking, OK, as application developers, which would we like? Or uh, you know, when we get feedback from people, what are the things they're asking for the most? So we tried to put it in, the, in that order. So um, yeah, I mean, one option certainly is like, let's really nail down those first three um, and then work from there. Yeah, that sounds good. If they are like uh, actual developers that uh, can also say, we are excited about these first three, that's, uh, that's even better. I spoke to one this morning and said, will you please come make your voice be heard in the working group? And he said, he may. Uh, GitHub is fine as well. I just wanted to mention uh, to Yanoar's comment about how does the JavaScript actually look when using this API. Uh, for the new proposal, I do not have, uh, for example, yet. But uh, on my GitHub, where I put the old proposal, I do have an example application that uses the older API. So it will look uh, fairly similar. Uh, of course, it looks a bit different uh, going with capsule events versus uh, Booleans. Uh, but it still hopefully has some uh, view of what it might look like. Uh, and I also wanted to um, mention uh, one of the differences, uh, or sorry, uh, regarding cancelable events versus the other approach. So uh, we will still have explicit methods in both approaches to actually do things like remove a candidate pair. It's just about how do you prevent the default behavior to happen? Do you say at one point that you want to stop the default behavior from happening altogether, or do you make that decision? when that event is about to happen. So I think that's the main difference between those two approaches. Uh, we haven't agreed on that yet, but uh, yes, it might uh, benefit from broader discussion or we can uh, discuss that uh, later. Now. Yeah, just to chime in, uh, there seems to be a big semantic difference though between only being reactionary to the ICE agent and wanting to control things on your own time. That seems to be the big difference in the APIs. And so maybe well, in some cases, one would be better than the other. And it might not be the same. Well, uh, to be clear, for things like, say, removing candidate pairs, there's there's a method to remove them from both. It, it's really just how do you prevent them from being automatically removed? And in, in one case, you're saying, listen to this event and always cancel it. And the other you're saying, um, just tell it, never remove. 
right. this candidate. So, so if we fire an event already, uh, but, yeah, so in that case, we're trying to prevent some uh, an action, and that seems like cancel events might fit. But if the goal is to uh, remove a candidate pair uh, rather than prevent it from being removed, then a method seems good. Right, and for, for both, like the, there are parts where uh, Samir and I were yeah. not in agreement, mm -hmm. and then there are parts where right. we were. The part where we were in agreement was having a method that mm -hmm. removes them. Yeah, so that, that I don't think, good. yeah. I think I did. I don't didn't particularly like the boolean that was on the add event to whether it could be removed or not. That seemed a little awkward. Okay, so Does that makes sense. In, in that in that case, you're in favor of cancelable event, I guess. In that case, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, right, for so the good. notes, do we have next steps written down? I guess continue to develop the proposal. Is that uh, I'm hearing, uh, generally speaking, I'm hearing support from all sides, and we should just, uh, you know, get down and dirty with uh, the specific proposals, starting with the top of the list. And uh, if if that's successful, then we'll have more motivation to keep going down the list. Okay. And uh, I think down, the down and dirty should include examples. Is what Yomi part wanted, right? Yes, and we should get examples. Um, in, in terms of how to move forward uh, in meetings coming up, one question that's come up is how many people will be in person for TPAC um, and whether we'll have an in person TPAC meeting or we'll need to. Uh, so, UN is saying thumbs up, you'll be there at, you'll be there at TPAC. Is that right? Yeah. Well, okay. So it would be great uh, to is anyone else going to be okay. there in person at TPAC? I think it's too early to say for most Googlers. Okay. All right. So UN is the only one who's got his thumbs fully up. Everyone else, maybe not. Okay. All right. So uh, UN UN says thumbs down on his on him being alone. Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to move on to the next uh, item, which I think is Yanivar play out delay. Uh, yes. So uh, yes. So you may not remember, but there's a, an API called uh, Receiver Playout Delay. It, it's implemented in Chrome as Receiver Playout Delay Hint, uh, but it's in extension spec. And there have been uh, multiple issues opened around how it works. And basically, um, at Mozilla, we're trying to implement it, and some we found some new issues as well. Uh, and so there's been some discussion. There seems to be some alignment. So we want to run this by the broader working group to see if that alignment holds. Uh, so some of the issues are, uh, does play out delay of video affect jitter buffer of synced audio and vice versa? Uh, should we clarify play out delay input value? Is it jitter buffer depth or jitter buffer depth, depth plus uh, play out path delay that you might expect from the browser? Um, should play out delay be milliseconds? Because right now it is seconds, which is a mistake that uh, it had inherited from get stats. <laughs> Basically, there's a design principle to say use milliseconds in the platform, uh, except in get stats, it uh, might have been my fault even, we uh, ended up using plain seconds. Um, there's also uh, uh, media working group is also using microseconds for video frames, so lots of fun. Um, there's an issue on whether to call it playout delay or playout delay hint. Um, and even though uh, Chrome implements hint right now, but it also doesn't throw in some cases it should, so it might be uh, they might be amenable to a new name. It might be better for web combat anyway because it would otherwise work differently. And how does a web developer decide on the value of playout delay? And most of the discussion was in the testability of playout delay hint, which was issue number 12. <clears throat> and to summarize, I've summarized some of the concerns, but some of the insights I think that we arrived at <clears throat> is that delay really is a measurement of a negative side effect. It's not a desirable effect to get a delay. Um, 
So I illustrate this with a car that has a drago meter that reports back the drag you're experiencing. Um, so it's a vague input already, jitter buffer plus AV sync playout delay path, or what is it? And this makes it hard to test. Uh, it's also confusing implementers. For instance, there's, there's a, an upstream bug about video delay actually being induced outside of jitter buffer by changing the timestamps, which seems to be a waste of time, but may have been mostly to keep AV sync. Uh, maybe audio was the most pressing issue at the time. Uh, so, but instead of focusing on the negative side effect, for a control surface, I think it, we think it would be more desirable to uh, control something positive, which is the positive goal is jitter-free media. Next slide. So instead, make the input value the target jitter buffer depth and nothing more. So the proposal here is receiver.jitter buffer depth equals uh, a value in milliseconds, which is the W3C design principle, section 8.3, which it says to use milliseconds for time measurement. Uh, and instead of uh, and basically, let the application then compare that to the gradually matching that delay measurement they, they would already get from stats. And I have a JavaScript fiddle here that works in Chrome. And it shows some of the JavaScript of how you would uh, get those stats, which are basically jitter buffer delay uh, divided by jitter buffer emitted count. Gives you a value in seconds. So you have to multiply by 1,000 to get uh, milliseconds. And you can compare that. And the spec already allows implementations to gradually uh, change its value over time, so you won't see it change immediately. There is also, I believe, a jitter buffer target, jitter buffer target delay that might also fit in here. But uh, for the for this presentation, uh, I just wanted to get a, a general sense if we think this is a good direction or good change. Thoughts? Uh, Henrik? So my understanding is that what what you're proposing, we should uh, implement and, and basically mandate that, yes, this is a control server for the user buffer. My understanding is that this is what's already implemented. And the fact that we saw difference in the user buffer and actual delay is is probably just a, a bug in how the user buffer delay is reported uh so overall i'm i'm, I'm uh, supportive of this direction and if we're lucky this is already what's implemented and we just need to land a, a bug fix in what gets that exposes rather than changing the implementation uh so my only um my thought on um milliseconds and changing the name and whether or not to throw an exception uh, uh, which was the difference um I, I i i'm supportive of the of the proposal i think i think it all sounds good i would i would question if is it worth to change the name if it's already implemented like um it is the um, uh, is migration worth the new name, but if we're changing unit from seconds to milliseconds, then we'd have to change name anyway. Um, so I, I don't have a strong opinion. Basically, I think I think this is uh, this is how it should have been implemented all along. Um, but if we want to migrate, we should make sure we get something out of it. Um, basically, I'm supportive. Rambling. So no, that's very good to very good to hear. As far as whether it would change implementation, I think Chrome right now implements play out delay hint, which, whereas it, in the spec it says play out delay, so that's already a name change. Uh, if we change the name to match Chrome, then you would still have an issue that the spec says to throw about um, on values right. above four seconds. So so the if you the want to question do that, is what's the what's the easiest path forward? Like. Uh, <laughs> If we change the spec to say uh, play out delay hint, then there would be no migration uh, needed. And if we change the spec to say don't throw an exception, 
like I don't see the value in throwing the exceptions. So it, it both both the name and whether or not to throw the exceptions both seems like bike shedding. It doesn't really matter. So the question is, do we let? Uh, is it is it worth fixing these nitpicks for the sake uh, if it requires a migration, or is it like doesn't matter much if it's called this thing or the other? I think that's a good way to, to phrase the question, but uh, I think my answer would be that I would prefer a new name because otherwise it's not clear what changed. And there are also reasons I believe that we had for throwing above four seconds, because if you add like 20 seconds of delay to a WebRTC real-time communication connection, it begs the question of what really is this thing and what our applications, I mean, already the surface is trying to use WebRTC, which is fine-tuned for real-time, uh, less than 100 millisecond for you know two-way communication without uh, stutter. My or understanding was that it was clamped, right? So either you know if mm -hmm. it's if four was the limit, I don't remember. Let's say four is the limit. If you set right. it to five, we could either say, oh, you set it to five. Five will just interpret it as four, <laughs> or you could say I'll throw an exception because it's bad input. And I, I, in my opinion, is it doesn't matter a whole lot which one we do. But if you feel strongly well, about changing the name, for example, uh, I'm not gonna object. Uh, I'm just curious if it's worth worth the name change. Henry, you, you, you said that uh, you, you think there might be a Chrome's bug, so that, that might be the first thing to, to check. If uh, is Chrome implementation correct or is there a bug? And, and then report that. And uh, if, if it's a different behavior, then a new name uh, for uh, a different behavior makes uh, makes a lot of sense. Otherwise, you see, if it's exactly the same behavior and there was just a small bug, then maybe it's not worth. Uh, I, I think it's the same behavior, and the bug is actually in what gets that returns, not what the play of delay hint does. That's my understanding. I have to double check. I I also am not a fan of uh, the word hint because that uh, we've, we've tried to get rid of that word hint in the past because it often suggests that uh, I, I think mostly we want control services that are testable and uh, confirmable in multiple implementations. And hints give the impression that uh, this it's optional to implement or if it doesn't work, that's OK. So no, I, 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 I agree with you. I think, I think the name was a mistake. Uh, my only hesitation is uh, how much, uh, how important it is to change the name. Um, does okay. anyone have a stronger opinion? Well, uh, mine would be to change, uh, my opinion would be to change it because then we can support it correctly. And also that would allow Chrome to deprecate uh, on its own schedule. I think I would be okay with that. Uh, I suspect this will come back to my table to actually do that. All right, I don't see anyone else on the queue, so. Okay. Is that it? So uh, we have some extra issues from UN, which we might actually get to. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Okay, so is, is, oh, yeah, issue 39, let's go with that. Um, so we're back in Media Capture Main where uh, we have tracks and they can be muted and muted is a Boolean and there's uh, mute and, and mute events. Uh, and this is used in, in Safari. Uh, you can see on, on the right where Safari is showing some uh, Chrome UI, some UI that allows the, the user to say, okay, I want this web page to no longer capture basically temporarily. And the user can switch on and off uh, capture. And then based on the user decision, uh, the muted um, state of the track will be updated or to true or to false. And th this allows controls to be on, on Safari, whatever the website is. And you can see on the left, uh, a typical like WebEx style um, UI, but um, websites are actually implementing to let the user decide. And uh, the issue here is that you can, if you have like two selections, 
if the user is select is uh, using one and then the other and so on, it, it becomes very complex to for the user, and it would be good to uh, be able to uh, sync uh, both so that uh, there's a good way for the website to influence whatever the uh, uh, you the Safari or the Chrome is um, actually uh, exposing and the reverse. Uh, next slide. So if if we look at um, uh, OS level indicators currently uh, on on camera side, the, it's pretty it's pretty deployed. Uh, there's the green pill. There are like um, um, Safari, Chrome, Firefox uh, UIs as well. And uh, based on that, websites tend to stop camera when when muting uh, when they really want to to mute. And uh, so there's there's the desire to uh, enforce muting. Um, there was there, we we did uh, some effort to allow some kind of muting if um, the website is uh, using enables to false for all the tracks, but it's it's a bit error prone and uh, I, I'm not sure it's being used uh, widely, uh, but stopping tracks is being used. Uh, for OS level microphone indicator, um, so it's deployed as well. Um, iOS has, has it, for instance, but websites do not tend to stop microphone when muting. And uh, one reason maybe is the ability to detect uh, whether user is speaking. So WebEx has this nice feature where uh, you're muted but uh, if you start speaking, then uh, WebEx will show uh, some UI that tells you, hey, you're speaking, but you're muted. So maybe you want to click uh, that button. And uh, some OSs uh, like iOS are supporting this ability. Uh, the website does not have access to the microphone samples uh, or the application does not have access to the microphone itself, but it has access to whether uh, there is some speech activity uh, ongoing and then it can unmute itself and so on natively so if we have that and it's being used natively it would be great to be able to expose that uh, in websites as well so the proposal here is to uh, have a straightforward api to for the web application to either request muting or unmuting of camera or microphone uh, next slide so th there are like um, three different levels of granularity that we could use. It could be at the track level, you request uh, muting, and then you mute the track source, meaning that all the track clones are also muted. Um, we could have some API at the device level, like input device info, so that you, you don't care about the, the track itself. Uh, again, it would be request mute, request unmute, and it would mute the same thing, the track source. Or we could have, uh, even a navigator API, which would be like uh, you request to mute all capture ongoing in a web page. Um, that's, that's easier for uh, uh, UI for Safari or Chrome or Firefox UI to, to expose the fact that, yeah, you're muted and it's not like uh, one camera is muted, but the other is not muted. Uh, that may be complex. Um, so th these are all three proposals. I think that uh, I would go with either the first or the second one personally, but uh, I'm welcoming uh, input uh, for both whether uh, people find, find request mute interesting, request unmute interesting, and uh, if so, uh, the granularity of uh, what uh, we should target. Thoughts? Yanivar? Uh, yes, so uh, I, I'm supportive of this. Uh, there's some privacy concerns, of course, with um, the, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. OK, uh, it's telling me I can't be heard, but OK. <laughs> Maybe I was double muted. Um, I, I think I, um, I think the privacy concerns here need to be met, which would mean that you would require uh, user gesture, uh, transient activation or maybe even consuming transient activation for this method um i think my preference would be uh to put it on the track because uh i think uh user agents it's that would leave it up to user agents what to do uh, and i think that might be fine um the i would when you say request unmute i would kind of just call it unmute 
would be my bike shed preference. And then if it doesn't work, then you get an error. Um, so, so for request unmuting, um, I want the user agent to be able to, to prompt. Um, because maybe a muted happened like two, uh, two days ago and you, you mm -hmm. unmute and maybe you, you, you lost the user actual, uh, um, the, the user might want to again uh, provide the, um, the approval. So that's why it's a promise and mm -hmm. that's why it's yes. request and mute. For mute, uh, I think since you're releasing, it could be a uh, mute. And that's all because I don't think that user agents will want to actually uh, disallow muting. But uh, I, I went with uh, both request mute to request unmute just for uh, parity there. Okay, I, I don't know that I I don't understand the use case for mute, and I'm not sure. I think my I would focus uh, the, on the mute. The the, um, the mute use case is that if you have tracks, you clone them, uh, you transfer them, blah blah blah. Uh, you would need to chase each one of them. To actually set enable SQL false, uh, and that's uh, that's very error prone. And what you actually want is to mute the source. You you do not want to disable each track actually. And you you might not even want to when you set enable equal false, you might not want to unmute it actually. There may be some applications that do not want the track the source to be muted. They just want this track to be uh, uh, silent. So I think it's better to. Uh, keep uh, a specific mechanism for mute. Okay, I, I, I still think we might benefit from separating discussions there of unmute versus mute, because I, I'm not quite following, because if I'm transferring a track and, uh, and there's a clone, that clone could also request mute or unmute, right? Yeah, and both then would be, uh, would be muted. But then if you want to mute uh, all of them, you, you need both of them to set enable equal force. So um, but that's that's the issue really. So I, I think it's good if you if you add, if you if one uh, website wants mute, uh, mm -hmm. it's better to be able to do that without too much coordination. And uh, I fear that uh, we might uh, end up into issues. Uh, generally, it's it's a little bit like um, get display media where we have a source and we want an API. Uh, roughly at the source level. There, it's an API that is tied to a source and not to a track. Uh, that's why I, there was this input device info uh, approach there, where uh, you would say, okay, you're targeting the source, you're not targeting the track. Okay. Yeah, no, Yeah. I, my feedback would be uh, on the track, I like the promise, and I would focus on unmute, and maybe without the word request. Uh, then I'll let others speak. Okay, uh, I think, so is there like uh, agreement to go forward basically with uh, this direction, I guess? Maybe yeah, it's just Johnny Bar and I that are interested, but uh, still, it might be good to record that. Uh, for issue 263, since there are only uh, two minutes, I think we can leave that for next month and Ilad, uh, I know what, what Ilad thinks there, but it's better if Ilad in, is in the room as well. So we can leave that for uh, next month. Okay, we finally got to the the animal or the mammal. Anybody want to name the mammal? It's a reindeer. It's a reindeer. Yes. Ah, yeah, oh, that's right. Anyway, uh, thanks to everyone. We finally got through a slide deck, or at least 99% of it. Um, and we will see you in the bitstream next month. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.